The title of the sermon is, We Know, But Do We Really? You see, in his first letter, the Apostle John is using a certain phrase over and over again, by this we know. And so he's talking a lot about knowledge. Now he did so because he had to contend with wrong Gnostic teachers who had come into the church. And so he wanted to encourage the brethren to stand firm and to hold on to correct knowledge because those Gnostic teachers pretended that they knew the truth. In Greek, the word for knowledge is gnosis. Agnosis, if you please, or in today's language, agnostic, is someone who doesn't know. So they thought, we know. But these teachers taught fundamental errors. John makes a point over and over again that these gnostics who thought that they knew the truth and that they taught the truth were in fact agnostics. In other words, they didn't know anything about the truth. These Gnostics taught, for example, that the spirit or spirit was inherently good and that matter or flesh was inherently evil. And therefore, Christ could not have come in the flesh because he could not have become a man that would have meant he had become inherently evil, according to that teaching. And so one of John's purposes was to show that the incarnation did in fact take place, that it had to take place for you and I to have a savior, that we could even obtain forgiveness of sin. The Gnostics or Gnostics were so concerned with their perceived superior knowledge that they didn't think that their conduct mattered. John had to address this question too, showing that proper conduct and upright living was important, as important as correct knowledge. In fact, both go hand in hand. You cannot separate the one from the other. I found this comment by the Life Application Bible quite interesting. They wrote, the main problem confronting the church at this time was declining commitment. Declining commitment. Many believers were conforming to the world's standards, failing to stand up for Christ, compromising their faith. False teachers were plentiful, and they were accelerating the church's downward slide away from the Christian faith. They go on to say that John wrote this letter to put believers back on track. Have you heard that statement before? Putting the church back on track? I remember how Mr. Armstrong talked about that very concept in the late 70s, early 80s. I think after that, the church completely drifted away from the truth. And yes, believers have to be brought back on track. The commentary goes on to say, John wrote this letter to put or to show the difference between light and darkness, between truth and error, and to encourage the church to grow in genuine love for God and for one another, the right kind of love. Not that theoretical, sweet-sounding love concept. Now, when John speaks in his first letter about what we know, and that's something you could never tell when you just read the English translation. He is using two different words in the Greek. And that's extremely important. The two Greek words which he used are ginosko, and you will hear me talk about that word quite a bit today. Ginosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. And of course that word is related to the Greek noun gnosis for knowledge. But then he's also using a different word, and that is oida, O-I-D-A, oida. Now, if you are a lover of operas, you might have heard the opera name Aida, but that's not what it is. It's oida. It's an O. So these are the two words. And of course, they both mean to know, but they are different in emphasis. They are different distinctions. 
The Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words points out the difference between ginosko and oida demand consideration. Ginosko frequently suggests inception or progress in knowledge, while oida suggests fullness of knowledge. So the one is talking about a process, the other one is talking about completeness. And that's very important. Because if you go with me to John chapter 8 and verse 55, the two words are used here by Jesus, and an important distinction is made. John 8, 55. He says, yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Now, where he says you have not known him, the other word is ginosko. And where he says I know him, the word is oida. In other words, you have not even begun to know anything about the true God, but I have complete, full, perfect knowledge of God. That's what he's trying to say here. And now let's go to 1 John. Now I'm not going to read the entire letter of 1 John today because then we would be here for several hours for sure. But I want to hit the highlights as to where he is talking about knowledge. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. What do you think? In both cases, the same word is used. What word is he, will, is, is he using here? Well, in both cases, he's using the word ginosko. Now by this we know, we begin to know, that we know him, we begin to know him, if we keep his commandments. We begin to know God when we keep his commandments. To the extent that we keep his commandments, we realize more and more how God thinks. A process is described here. With more and more obedience comes more and more knowledge of God and of our relationship with him. If we don't obey God, the point is we don't really know God. We don't even begin to know him. We don't begin to know his character. And John echoes here what Jesus said in John chapter 7 and in verse 17. Let's keep your finger in First John, but let's go to John chapter 7 and in verse 17. If anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Again, the word here is... Ginosko. It describes a process of getting to know God and his way of life more and more to the extent that we obey him. But the opposite is true as well. We cannot even begin to think that we know God if we don't keep his commandments. And that's what John points out in 1 John chapter 2 and in verse 4. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 4. He who says, I know him, and doesn't keep his commandments, he is a liar, and the truth isn't in him. The one who says, I know him. Here the word is ginosko. In other words, the one who doesn't keep his word is even lying when he says that he has begun to know God. He has no concept of God. You see, God tells us that he gives us his Holy Spirit, but only when we obey him. And once we have received the Holy Spirit, but cease to obey him, convincing ourselves that we don't have to obey him anymore, God will ultimately take his Spirit away from us. So this person is perhaps humble enough to say, oh, I know something about God. But John says, you don't know anything about God if you don't keep his commandments. And he continues to say in 1 John chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. 
But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Again, by this we know that we are in him. The word here again is ginosko. Why? Why? The love of God is perfected in a person who keeps God's word because John defines later in the letter the love of God is keeping God's commandments. But nobody will reach this kind of perfection in this life in the flesh. However, we must work toward it. And as we do, we will know God more and more, and we will know that our relationship with God is becoming more and more intimate. And that is why John uses the word ginosko here for understanding that by this we know, we're beginning to know and growing in that knowledge gradually and progressively that we are in him when we keep his words. The more we obey, again the same concept, the more we learn about God and his character. But also John points out the contrast in 1 John chapter 2 and in verse 11. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 11. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. What word do you think John is using here now? Well, he is using the word oida. Oida, remember, describes full and complete knowledge. But here it's used in the negative. A person who hates his brother is in the eyes of God totally, completely, absolutely void of knowledge as to what he is doing. He's completely blind, totally unaware of where he is going. And John goes on to say in 1 John chapter 2, for the thought 13 and 14. 1 John chapter 2, let's read it for the 13 and 14. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. In all these statements, he's using the word ginosko. John is addressing the fathers and the children, and he says to them three times, that they have known the Father and Jesus Christ. In other words, they were in the process of getting to know the Father and, and Jesus Christ more and more. Notice an interesting passage in Luke chapter 10 in this regard. Luke chapter 10 and verse 22. Luke 10 and verse 22. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the, who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Again, the word here, ginosko. No one can know anything about the Father and the Son unless it's being revealed to them. See, this completely excludes all these worldly preachers out there who say that they preach in the name of Christ, in the name of God, and they know nothing. According to what John is saying here, what Christ is saying here, they know nothing about God. What is amazing to me is that people out there are surfing the internet to find out what those preachers tell them, thinking that they can get some kind of truth and understanding from these concepts. And John says they know nothing. The truth isn't in them. Why do you listen to them? Let's go back to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. Little children, 
It is the last hour. A better translation would be it is a last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist, again here, as you have heard that Antichrist, the word the is not in there, Antichrist is just a spirit which is opposed to Christ, is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is a last hour. So let's read it again. Little children, it is a last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is a last hour. Now, the word used here for know is skinasko. That is, we begin to understand, we begin to know that in this particular case, they had reached a last hour. John, in particular, is not referring here to the return of Christ, but to a time when it had become critically important to make right decisions and stand up for the truth. Because later, John defined enter Christ as those ministers who were teaching a different Jesus, one who had not come fully in the flesh, or one who denied that Christ was coming in the flesh today by living in God's true disciples through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. But I believe that John can also, in a sense, be inspired to talk about us today because all the scriptures are actually written for our admonition, as we know. And so let's look at it from this standpoint. Little children, it is the last hour. We are very close to Christ's return. So in that regard, notice what we read in Mark chapter 13. Because there are always some people who want to find out, try to figure out dates. When exactly is Christ going to come back? I just got one memo the other day. And this person concluded that he comes back in 2035 or something. Mark chapter 13 and verse 32. Notice what Christ is saying. Of that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now here, the word for no one knows is and has to be oida. No one knows perfectly Surely, when this is going to happen, not even the son knows it. Why is that the case? Well, because the father is making that decision. The father may not even have made that decision yet, because we can delay and we can accelerate the return of Jesus Christ. It depends on us, on our conduct, to an extent. And so therefore, the son wouldn't even know perfectly well when he has to return, because the decision is not even his to make, but the father's. But Christ is also telling us that we look, look at the signs of the time, the parable of the fig tree, and notice how that's worded in Matthew chapter 24 and in verse 33. Matthew 24 and verse 33. It's just talking about the signs, describing what will happen leading to his return. And then he says in verse 33, so you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the very doors. Of course, here the word is ginosko. I mean, you are looking at these things and you realize more and more, aha, we are getting closer to it. You still don't know the exact time. You don't know in the sense of oida, but you know in the sense of ginosko. See, you are growing towards that understanding. And that's what we should be doing. If we are looking at the signs of the time, when we are looking at the news today, now some don't want to look at the news, but those who do, I mean, you've got to be blind. You've got to be absolutely blind not to be able to see where this world is going. And so you should be able to see that. You should be able to understand that the time is near. But you don't know perfectly when it's going to happen. Not even Jesus Christ knows. Not the angels know. Because God the Father is making that decision when he decides that the time has arrived. In 2 John chapter 2 and in verse 20. I'm sorry, in 1 John. Let's not get our head. <laughs> in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20. 
to 22. He goes on to say, But you have an anointing from the Holy, Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lies of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Again, what do you think, what word John is using under inspiration here? Yes, in all these cases, three times, he's using the word oida. Perfect knowledge. Complete knowledge. Now, John wasn't saying here that anyone had attained the same kind of perfect knowledge that God has. But notice the context. He was talking about the fact that Jesus was the Christ, the Savior of mankind. And in that regard, true Christians have attained perfect and complete knowledge. There cannot be any doubt about this vital issue. And how is this perfect knowledge obtained and received? Well, he points it out right here, by the Holy Spirit, the anointing which was given to us. And then, what does this perfect knowledge of the truth that Jesus Christ was the Messiah include? Extremely important, that he came in the flesh that he was fully man, that he died for us, that there is no other way to salvation and to God the Father than through Jesus Christ. If somebody does not have this full knowledge, he does not have, and I say this very, very clearly, God's spirit, there's no way, there's no way. Because God's anointing the Holy Spirit convicts us even of more than that. Notice 1 John chapter 2 and verse 29. And if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is, it says here, born, should be begotten of him, begotten by the Holy Spirit. Again, let's go back. If you know here the word is oida. You are fully, completely, totally convinced that he is righteous. If you don't believe that, that Jesus Christ was righteous, that he never ever sinned, there's no way you could have God's Holy Spirit in you. So you have to absolutely be completely, totally convinced of the fact that Jesus Christ was righteous and is righteous and never sinned. But he goes on to say, then you know, and here the word is ginasko, that everyone who practices righteousness is born or begotten of God. Because here we're talking about a process. If we are totally persuaded, convicted, that Christ was righteous without sin, then we are to follow him. And we become more and more knowledgeable about the truth and that we can only live like he did if we have received the Holy Spirit. Now, we never reach this perfection in this life, so that's why this word, ginasko, is used. It's a process. You're becoming more and more in line with how Jesus Christ lived. We understand more and more that we cannot practice righteousness without God's Holy Spirit. Some try to do this on their own. They will fail. They always have failed, and there's no way you can do it on your own. So they understand this more and more, that without God's Holy Spirit dwelling in us, leading us, we cannot be righteous people in the eyes of God. But first, we may know this only intellectually, while you've learned about it, read about it. But in doing it more and more, you understand this more from a practical standpoint as well. And having said that, he goes on to say in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Again, the same kind of concept. The word here is ginasko in both cases. The world doesn't even begin to know Christ. And as a consequence, the world doesn't even begin to know us, in whom Jesus Christ dwells. That's a concept you should think about. 
That's why we can have nothing to do with the ideas, the concepts, the teachings of the world. He goes on to say in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been revealed yet what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, because we, will sh we shall see him as he is. Now again, what word is he using here? There's only one possibility. Of course, the word is oida. We know completely, totally, perfectly well that when he is revealed, when he returns, we will be like him. We will be part of the God family. We will carry his image as he is carrying the image of the Father. We don't know that. I don't see how God's Holy Spirit can be within us. We totally, fully, and perfectly are convinced of the fact that we will be like Jesus Christ in the resurrection or the change to eternal life. A true Christian knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that he will become a full member in the family of God, that he will be God, that Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. He will bear Christ's likeness, but this knowledge has consequences. Because John goes on to say in verse 3, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And he goes on to say in verse 4, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Or as the authorized version puts it, sin is the transgression of the law. Now, how clear is that? We purify ourselves by abstaining from sinning. We won't continue breaking God's law anymore. Now, I'm not talking about you can never on occasion sin. That's not what he is referring to. He's talking about a practice, a way of life. As true Christians in whom Christ's spirit dwells, we will try to live as Christ lived. And we know how he lived. He know why he came. First John chapter 3 and verse 5. And verse 6. And you know. Again, I will lift the suspense here. Oh, Ida, you know perfectly well, you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. You know that. You must know that. He goes on to say, whoever abides in him does not sin, does not practice sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him or discerned him clearly, nor known him. And guess what? Here the word is ginosko. He hasn't even started yet to have any concept, any understanding about Jesus Christ. He thinks he can continue living a practice of sin, that grace is a concept where you are allowed to sin, you believe that, you have no concept of Jesus Christ. You haven't even begun to know him. True Christians know perfectly well that Christ came to die for our sins. But those who practice sin, we are not talking here about, as I said, an occasional slip-up, they have never clearly known him. They have never truly discerned why Christ came and why he did for us and why he and why he died for us and what he did for us, have never even begun to perceive this or understand him, who he was, who he is, what he did, and what he does. And so he goes on to say in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14 to 16. 1 John chapter 3 verses 14 to 16. We know... First, I won't tell you now which words are being used. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who doesn't love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down for his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The first time and the second time where he says we know 
that we have passed from death to life, the word is oida. We know this perfectly well. We have passed from death to life. Also where it says, you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him, the word is oida. You know that perfectly well. There's no doubt about it. A murderer has no eternal life abiding in him. But then he says, but this, by this we know love, here the word is ginosko. Why? Because you are getting to the point of understanding it more and more. True Christians know that they must love their brethren. This is perfect total knowledge. They also know that someone who practices hate as a way of life could not possibly be converted. And if he or she is, hate will lead to the loss of the Holy Spirit. And we can begin to comprehend love and gradually and progressively understand love better and better when we understand that Christ came to this earth to die for us. And because he did, we must be willing to do likewise for our fellow brethren. And so he explains what that means. First John chapter 3, verses 18 to 20. My little children, 1 John 3, verse 18, let us not love in word or in tongue. Oh, well, I love you. And that's all there's ever to it. Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deeds and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Now, you would at first reading assume that especially the last statement, God is greater than our heart and knows all things, here the word would be oida, right? He knows all things perfectly, but it's not. And the first word in the first, in the second sentence, and by this we know that we are of the truth, it's also not oida. In both cases is ginosko. Why? Why? In both cases. We're not talking about perfect love here, and perfect understanding, rather. Well, the context is our conduct. To the extent that we love our brethren more and more, indeed and truthfully, we are persuaded and know more and more that we are doing the right thing. And to that extent, God knows more and more about us. In other words, he learns everything about us to the extent that we love others. Think about that one. God is watching us. What does God know about you and me? In Matthew chapter 7, Christ is making a profound statement. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23. Because here are people who said, oh, have we not in your name done this and that and the other thing? And he's answering them in Matthew 7 and verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, or who transgress the law. I never knew you. Here he's using the word ginosko. I have never even begun to know you. You who are practicing lawlessness, who are transgressing the law, telling the people that I came to do away with the law, and don't keep it, I don't even have an inkling of who you are. I never knew you. I never even have begun to know you. That's why he's using the word ginosko. He says, get away from me. Get away from me. But look at a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 24 and in verse 12. Now that's talking about the ten virgins and here are the five foolish ones. Christ is giving a slightly different answer. Now, they were not ready. They were asleep. They all were asleep. But the five woke up, and the other five didn't have enough oil. And then they wanted to come entering the kingdom of God, knocking at the door. And what is Christ saying here? Is he saying, get away from me in the eternal hellfire? No, he's not saying that. Look what he's saying. Matthew 25 and verse 12. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. That's all he says. Guess what word he's using here? 
He's using the, using the word oida. In other words, I do not know you perfectly. I know you to an extent. I have been watching you, but I don't know you perfectly. So he is talking about people in the church. In all likelihood, those who are not ready when Christ comes back, but it doesn't say that they have committed the unpardonable sin or that they're going to be thrown in the lake of fire. They will continue to live into the millennium until Christ knows them perfectly well, until they have clearly shown where they are. And then they are going to be changed into God beings. I believe that that's exactly what this is talking about. The distinction between those two words in Matthew 7 and Matthew 25 is another hint that that is what Christ is referring to. In 1 John chapter 4 and in verse 2 and 3. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is a spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and it is now already in the world. Now, in verse 1, he had said that we have to test the spirits. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You see, it's not always quite evident from the outset whether or not a spirit or a spiritual message is from God. Some of these spiritual messages sound pretty good, right? Specifically, recently, we have been hearing them from certain corners. Oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. Are these really messages from God? Or are these messages which come from human reasoning? We go in this knowledge, and John says that if someone denies the fact that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that he was fully man, then such a message is not the truth. It's not inspired by the spirit of truth. But there are variations. And so we must grow in the perception of what is truth and what is error. Even though some may say Christ became fully man, they may also say that he remained to be fully God. That is not true. That is an error. And that is why John is using the word in 1 John, which we just read, by this you know the Spirit of God. He's using the word ginosko, because it's again something you have to learn, you have to understand, you have to grow into this kind of knowledge. And you go into this kind of knowledge by testing the Spirit. You need to know what the truth is, of course. And the Bible is telling us very clearly, you know the truth. And some will come and give you all kinds of variations. Like Christ was fully God and fully man. Like Christ didn't really die. Like Christ was part of the Trinity, and the Trinity always is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so when Christ died, just the human shell died, and the Son of God was still in heaven alive. And on and on, the blasphemy goes. The blasphemy which has been taught in the world about church of God after Mr. Armstrong died. And many to an extent or another, have taken this blasphemy with them when they went to other churches. And that's why you sometimes get messages when you hear some of those from other churches. You have to shake your head and say, where's that coming from? Well, it's coming from this false teaching, which some, having been there in the World War Church of God too long and having been listening to this nonsense, have adopted. Notice 1 John chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 6. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. And he who is not of God doesn't hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born better begotten of God and knows God. He who doesn't love doesn't know God, for God is love. In all these passages where the word knows is used, the word is gnosko, in every single one of them. Because what's being described here is a process. It's a process of getting to know God more and more by our loving others. And those who have begun to know God will hear us. And those who have not begun 
to recognize the true God in their lives won't even hear us. We're not talking about full knowledge here. They haven't even begun to know God, and they will not hear us. That's why we get sometimes these nasty messages by people who don't agree with what we are teaching. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 13, it goes on to say, 1 John 4 and verse 13, by this we know, again, the Greek word is ginosko, that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us off his spirit. One of the proof texts showing us that the Holy Spirit is in God. God the Father and Jesus Christ give us off their spirits. That's the entirety. But by this we know, it says, that we abide in him and he in us. God's spirit in us convicts us more and more of the fact that we abide in God. And to the extent that we use God's spirit, we know that too, to the extent that we use God's spirit. The more we do, the more we will know that nothing can and ever will separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ. Do we know that? As we wrote in our Q&A this week, are we too afraid to attend services because we might get sick over there? Oh, we better not go in because we might get sick over there. What a fearful attitude that is. What a fearful attitude. First John chapter 4 and verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. You see, we have known this because we have experienced it more and more. Not to the fullest extent yet. That's why John is using the word gnosko here again. We have known, we have gotten to know this more and more. And we do this by experiencing God's love when we are loving others in the right way. In the right way. And this is how we can get to know God more perfectly. And also his very nature of love. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments. You can't separate that. And again. By this we know, the word is ginosko, we become more and more acquainted with this understanding that we love God when we keep his commandments. We know understand that we love God's children when we love God and as a consequence we keep his commandments because the commandments are God's law of love. When we don't keep God's law, we don't love God and we don't love God's children. Now think about that one. First John chapter 5 and verse 13. Do you love God? Do you love God's children when you separate yourself from God's church? Rather than assembling in person, you're staying home? How do you have this interconnection between God's children? See, none of that makes any sense if you think about it. It makes no sense. But who is to say that the stuff is supposed to make sense? First John chapter 5 and verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Here the word has to be and it is oida. If you don't know that perfectly, that you have eternal life because God's spirit is in you, <laughs> where are you? Where are you? We have to know. We have to be totally and perfectly convinced that we have eternal life. That is, that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, which is the divine nature, which is a guarantee for our change into a spirit being at the time of Christ's return. We can have this conviction because we believe in the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And this is an obedient faith. We believe in him and we keep his word as a consequence. We believe in what he did and what he does for us today and what he will do for us in the future. We believe in his name and his power and his authority. And then we can know, we must know absolutely without any doubt whatsoever that we have eternal life, that we have God's Holy Spirit within us. Now, in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, he goes on to say, Now this is a confidence that we have in him, 
that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Now that may come as a surprise a little. You might perhaps expect that here the word is used which designates a process, ginosko. So you know this more and more as God answers our prayers. But no, John is using the word oida. We know this perfectly well. Again, look at the context. If you go back to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22, John had made the following point. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You see, all of this goes together. We know that we will receive from God what we ask if we keep his commandments and do what is pleasing in his sight, and if it's God's will. John uses the Greek word oida twice in this passage we just read because there must not be any doubt in our minds that God will do what we ask of him if those and other conditions are met, like faith. In other words, if we doubt, we ask God for something, and if we doubt at the same time that God may hear us, what does James say? Well, somebody who doubts should not even think that he gets anything from God. No, it has to be perfect, complete conviction. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, we read something about God. Matthew 6 and verse 8. And again, this goes hand in hand now. This is what we are talking about. He says, well, you don't ask God in prayers time and time again with the same words, you know, like giving 10 Our Fathers and 15 Hail Mary and whatever. And this is what the Gentiles do, he says. But in verse 8 he says, therefore, do not be like them, those vain repetitions that the heathen use, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Your father knows. The word is oida. He knows perfectly well, without any shadow of doubt. Also in verse 32, where he says, For after all the things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. Again, the word is oida. He knows it perfectly well. He knows exactly what you need in your life. He knows exactly perfectly what even your thoughts may be before you even utter them. Going back to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God doesn't sin. Now here the word is again oida. We know this perfectly well without any doubt. Now this could refer to one who is begotten of God with the Holy Spirit, because such a person doesn't live in sin, doesn't practice sin as a way of life. Or the scripture could refer to one who is actually born of the Spirit into the family of God as an immortal spirit being, because such a one cannot sin anymore, even not as an occasional slipper, because as God he is incapable of sinning. So we know both of this perfectly well. There cannot be any doubt. It cannot be just a progression. Now we know it. Either we know it or we don't. First John chapter 5 and verse 19. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We know, O Ida, we know that perfectly well without any doubt that we are of God. We know that? Do we know that? Do we know that really? That we are of God? And do we also know at the same time that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one? That the whole world is captured by Satan? That the whole world is following Satan's evil devices? Do we know that perfectly well? That's why the question of the sermon. We know, but do we really? Do we really know this? The whole world is under Satan's sway. He has deceived the whole world. We shouldn't think that the world can offer us something which God doesn't want us to have. And likewise, do we really know that we are of God? Do we really know that? And that God and the world are enemies. Notice what John said earlier in John, 1 John chapter 2, 
verses 15 to 17. We read the scripture many times, but let's look at it in this context. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We know that, don't we? Perfectly well. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it is of the world. The world which is under the sway of Satan the devil. He goes on to say, the world is passing away, and Satan will be defeated. We'll be put under our feet shortly. And the lust of it will pass away, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Yes, we will be God beings in a few years from now. We are not to love the world or the things of the world. It says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. And now notice, as the last passage in this context, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. Here the word is oida. We know that perfectly well, without any doubt. God has come, the Son of God has come to give us an understanding. That we may know him. Now here the word is Inosco, because we are getting to know him more and more in the way we live. That we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in the Son, Jesus Christ. This is a true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols, including false teachings, false doctrines, false knowledge, which can become idols for us in our minds. And then he says, Amen. We should never think that Gnosticism is merely a teaching of the past. As John contended with the false concept in the first century, so we have to do the same in this last century of human rule. Gnosticism, that is the fundamental teaching of the falsely so-called Christian religion, is alive and well. It has found its way into the Church of God in recent years. And we must do everything we can to fight it and not to root it out, and to root it out rather, and to reject it when we are confronted with it. I've heard all kinds of teachings recently in other churches about, oh, Christ was fully God and fully man. And of course, many other related teachings. We have to contend in word and in conduct for the faith and the truth which was once and for all delivered to the saints. We must grow in right knowledge. Not do away with right knowledge, replacing it with wrong knowledge. We must grow in the knowledge of the Son of God, in Jesus Christ's knowledge. And we are doing this by right conduct. Now, as we have gone through this letter, we have seen that John uses several times a phrase, by this we know. And I'd like to quote them to you again, just the substance of it. Listen carefully if you put it all together. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth, and by this we know that we are of the truth. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God doesn't hear us. By this we know the Spirit of truth and the Spirit of error. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his Spirit. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Eight times he's using those words. By this we know. Two times four. Four means God is revealing himself. Two could mean harmony. It could mean contrast. Put it together and think about it. All of this will even lead to the world's recognition as to who we are even though they may not admit it. Notice Christ's statement in John chapter 13, 
and in verse 35. John 13 and verse 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Here the word is ginosko. By this all will begin to know, will begin to perceive, will come to more and more knowledge that we are Christ's disciples. We must grow in the knowledge of Christ to reach more and more perfection. You see, an interesting passage can be found in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13, it's a related word, but it nevertheless gives a concept here. Ephesians 4 and verse 13, Christ is giving some apostles, prophets, and so on for the equipping of the saints, the work of ministry, edifying of the body of Christ, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now this is talking here complete, perfect knowledge. Of course, it's a knowledge of the Son of God. But we all are to move towards it. We all have to grow in this kind of knowledge. And so in conclusion, I'd like to quote one more passage, one more statement which Christ made. It's a foundational, a fundamental, a, a profound statement. And that is in John chapter 13 and in verse 17. In John chapter 13 and verse 17. You know, he speaks of full or perfect knowledge here. A total and complete conviction. But that knowledge all by itself is not enough. It's got to be manifested by action. And so Christ is saying in John 13 and verse 17, if you know these things, and here he's using the word oida, you know them perfectly. You have absolute, perfect, complete understanding and knowledge. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them.